please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, Andrea. Um, it hadn't been that long since I've been here. I was trying to remember exactly when I was here. It wasn't too very long ago, and I don't want to talk about the same thing I did last time. So um, I, I'm going to talk about three things. I, I'm going to start with going over uh, an issue that is uh, out in the public discussion but really hadn't gotten the attention that it deserves yet, and that is the, the state's arrangement with the Superdome that's going to be the topic of a lot of discussion in the Bond Commission in the not-too-distant future. And I kind of want to go over uh, where that situation is and, and what the the, I believe, smart thing to do would be. And I'll talk a little bit about where we are with the, with the uh, state budget as well and, and then give you a little brief update on where we are with spending all this federal money that's come our way. And it, uh, it just continues to pour in. And we've got uh, plans on how to spend it, and those will be taking shape pretty quickly as some deadlines are fast approaching for the entities that are entitled to this money. So let me start and talk about the, the Superdome. And this involves the Superdome. It involves the LSED, which is the governing body of the dome. It involves the New Orleans Saints. And really, for the first time in, in as long as I can remember, that uh, these entities have been involved in negotiations and discussions. We're all wearing the same jersey. Uh, everybody is really on the same team now. And there's a great opportunity for the state uh, as we move forward. Uh, the, the Saints and the state and the LSED have developed a thoughtful plan uh, to upgrade the Superdome, which is almost 50 years old. It's one of the oldest uh, venues in the NFL, but it's also one of the most coveted when it comes to selecting places to have the Super Bowl. We've had more Super Bowls in New Orleans uh, than any other place other than Miami. I think we're tied right now. We've got another one coming in 2025. Um, New Orleans is really, when you think about it, the most attractive venue uh, for major events like this. The Superdome is literally within walking distance of most of the hotels in downtown New Orleans. The restaurants are everywhere. Uh, other Superdomes you read about that are held at, at stadia that have to be built outside of major communities, you've got to bust the teams and bust the fans. Uh, New Orleans is so connected, it's a very popular destination, and it becomes an extremely lucrative investment for the state of Louisiana to host events like the Superdome, like the uh, CFP Championship, the Final Four, all of which are, are coming here. Um, and the stars are, are really aligned right now to, to kind of cement the relationship that exists between these, these various entities. Um, you saw recently the, the four-part series in The Advocate and the Picayune about Gail Benson's legacy to the state. And I'll start by mentioning that. Uh, her generosity and her philanthropy and her recognition of, of, as she described, really a sense of duty to, to New Orleans is going to pay long-term dividends for the state of Louisiana. Um, that, her bequest that is going to be made after her passing uh, is going to enable a trust that's set up to provide tremendous assistance to people in New Orleans, to the state of Louisiana. And it is also laying the groundwork for the state to enjoy a long-term relationship with the Saints on sound financial footing without the kind of ongoing uh, negotiations that we've had to have through the years. All of that is predicated on completing the $450 million renovation to the Superdome, a project that the state committed to a number of years ago. It's ongoing today, and it's dependent upon future funding from the state in order to move forward. The current lease with the Saints expires in 2025. Fortune magazine in, the, in that four-part series called it the best lease in the NFL. Um, the Saints have naming rights, they have concession rights. Uh, there was an upgrade made to the dome and there was a lease that the state entered into in very, very favorable terms to Mr. Benson uh, for Benson Tower. All of that, and by, and by the way, since that lease was entered into, there have not been any subsidies by LFCD to the Saints. Uh, but more importantly, as part of the renegotiation of that lease, uh, we have much more favorable terms on the lease of Benson Tower. Uh, we're going to be paying market value instead of amounts above market value that we had been paying in the past. All of which is going to make Ms. Benson's legacy even more important once this long-term lease that's currently on the table is finalized. The new lease would be for 10 years with two 10-year extensions. That would ensure an arrangement keeping the Saints here till 2055. This is particularly important that this lease get finalized because the NFL prohibits franchises from relocating if it's breaking an existing lease. And so for the state to have a long-term lease like this is basically ensuring the Saints staying here till 2055. 
And of course, the, the legacy that Ms. Benson is leaving places the ownership of the saints, which she inherited from her husband, in trust uh, with the understanding that the trust is going to manage both franchises, the Saints and the Pelicans, um, to stay in Louisiana in accordance with this long-term plan. So the plan to upgrade the dome, which is already underway, has completed two phases. There are still remaining phases to be completed, and they're, they're scheduled uh, very carefully around the Saints' home games and around some of the events that are held in the, in the dome. This $450 million improvement is funded with $90 million from the state, $210 million from the LSED, which is based on their hotel motel tax and their self-generated revenue, and $150 million from the Saints. That's almost a third of that project being funded by the Saints, which is unprecedented in the relationship between the state and the Saints and the Dome over the years. We as an administration have been recommending that that a significant amount of the state's contribution, which is a little bit over $60 million, to be funded with what is called a debt commute or a debt conversion, a plan that's been deemed financially responsible and legal in an opinion by the Attorney General. The administration doesn't always agree with the opinions rendered by the Attorney General, but we're on the same page on this one. The Attorney General has recognized the legality of this transaction. And the Treasurer's Investment Officer has also reviewed it and is going to basically write off this conversion uh, over a period of years so that it's not taken in one particular year. Now, to understand what this is requires a little bit of history, but it's important that, that the public understand this process as well as the legislators and the Bond Commission members understand this. In 2013, the state refinanced our post-Katrina debt. The state actually bought bonds to be repaid by the LSED in order to smooth out the debt that they were paying on the repairs that were necessary to the dome after the storm. The, pr the principal and interest on this amount totals about $63 million. Right now, LSED is paying interest only on that obligation. They pay about $850,000 a year uh, to the state. Instead of that debt being paid in its entirety over a period of time that would take a couple of more decades, the debt is going to be commuted or converted, meaning that the present value of $63 million that otherwise would be paid by the LSED would be forgiven and applied to the $90 million that the state otherwise would be responsible for in the improvements to the dome. Um, so it makes a lot of sense to allocate that money to this obligation so the state does not have to use new money or capital outlay money to meet its portion of the obligation. So that is something that was introduced, it must be approved by the Bond Commission, that was something that was introduced back in 2019. Um, at that time there was never a vote taken on it. The treasurer and legislators had questions, they wanted to understand this a little better and so there was not a vote taken when it was initially proposed back in 2019. But then the pandemic hit. And when the pandemic hit, obviously the economy shut down and the Superdome was one of the major elements of the New Orleans economy that literally shut down. The hotel motel tax during the initial pandemic year went down by almost 75% for the, for the LSED. And the self-generated income that was realized by the LSED from events at the Dome evaporated by 90%. There were no events held. As we all know, nothing was happening. So there was no cash flow to keep the LSED operational, to keep the Superdome open. So in order to, meanwhile, part of this history, in order to get started on the Dome improvements and do the first two phases that I mentioned are already completed, the LSED issued bond anticipation notes those are notes that are issued knowing that you're going to get bond revenue down the line and you use that money to cash flow until your bonds are issued. Those bans were issued before the pandemic hit. And then when the pandemic hit and the LSED was basically unable to function, the dome was unable to open, to keep the situation going, they used the revenue from the bans in order to help pay operating expenses. They needed to safeguard the building. They needed to continue on time with the construction project, which is obviously lengthy but time sensitive. And so the ban revenue was used to 
that otherwise would have been used for the construction expenses. That's why, in addition to what I'm talking about regarding the debt commutation, there is a need for some additional money between the 60 million and the 90 million that the state's going to have to come up with in order to make this deal work. That'll be addressed in the 22 legislative session. But more urgently, the debt commute has to be addressed by the bond commission because the LSED has to sign a contract to complete the, the two remaining uh, portions of the construction because they have a construction manager at risk project. And this, is mean, this means they're paying a contractor. They're at risk. They give you a fixed price on what it's going to cost to do the work. That contract has to be signed by the end of the year. So we can no longer put this off and push it down the road like has been done in the past. And so it's going to be, have to be considered by the bond commission, um, I believe, at the November meeting. I'm hoping to have some discussion about this at the October meeting and then have a vote on this at the November bond commission meeting so that that can be uh, approved and the contract can be signed prior to the end of the year and the project will stay on schedule. If the bond, if this commutation, this conversion of this debt is not approved, the state is going to have to come up with the entirety of that $90 million, either from a one-time source of money or from capital outlay either of which is potentially doable, but it just doesn't make sense to do that if we can take care of this de debt conversion and fund the project that way and leave that other money for the many needs that we have from a capital outlay standpoint. So I'm, I'm hoping we're going to engender some discussion about this in October so bond commission members can answer questions, can uh, think about this and fully understand the significance of, of what this means to the state, what this means to the dome. So secondly, let me, let me talk a little bit about the, um, the ARP money and where we are in that process. We have four different pots of money that the Division of Administration is basically administering. Uh, the first is the Port Relief Fund, and all these funds were appropriated by the legislature. These are all federal dollars that came to the state appropriated by the legislature. A little bit more than 50 percent of what the state is ultimately receiving from ARP or about $1.6 billion has been appropriated by the legislature. The biggest chunk of it went to restore some funds into the, uh, the unemployment trust fund, which got drained literally down to about nothing during the pandemic when we had the, um, the unemployment that obviously was pervasive across the country. But one of the uses of the money was the support relief fund, $50 million, uh, designed to provide funding to ports in Louisiana who sustained a negative economic impact during the pandemic and it is reimbursing them for those expenses. Um, we've postponed the filing dates for the various requests that are to be made for this ARP money because of Hurricane Ida, which obviously tore everything asunder and, and, um, and really interrupted the very time frames that had been established to get these requests in. So the Port Relief Fund opened on October 7th, just last week. It'll close on November 6th. All the ports in the state will submit evidence of their negative economic impact from the storm, and $50 million will be allocated. If it's, if it's not the entire $50 million, it'll be returned for some other use. If it exceeds the $50 million, then it'll be prorated among all the ports that apply, and we anticipate that all the ports will apply. The second fund is the tourism fund. Uh, Seventeen and a half million dollars went to the Department of Culture, Recreation and Tourism directly to them. Uh, the remaining 60 million was placed by the legislature in what's called the Tourism Revival Program. Um, that fund will be allocated to local CVBs, Convention and Visitors Bureaus, offices, uh, those who have been established by the legislature in order to advocate for tourism in literally every parish of the state. The deadline to submit those applications has been pushed back to October 31st, and again, it is based upon negative economic impact that was visited upon these various tourism entities. Uh, they will have to submit their audited financial statements from calendar year 19, their audited financial statements for calendar year 20, and whatever loss they sustain between those two years will be offset with dollars from the tourism uh, revival program. Uh, whether or not all that money, that $60 million is spent, remains to be seen. I think it probably will be with lost revenue or negative economic impact. If it's not, we have set up a series of rules that 
uh, allows all the money to eventually go to those entities based upon a competitive submission that they will make in the event that there's any leftover money after just comparing the balance sheets. The third and most complex area is the water sector program, which is a $300 million program. That application deadline was moved back to November 1st. Uh, the Water Commission, uh, an equal number of senators and representatives, based upon recommendations that we make to them, will approve the ultimate allocation to various water entities, water districts across the state, and the Joint Legislative Committee on the Budget will have the final say to approve how much each of those entities gets. Uh, the legislation that created the fund contemplated that any water project that is in House Bill 2 that is in the capital outlay program would be eligible for these funds as well. So we have created in, in the portal a request for information from those water projects in the capital outlay bill to see where they are in the process so that they can be scored, evaluated, and graded by the team from LDH and from the Department of Environmental Quality that ultimately will make recommendations to the commission and to ultimately the committee. Uh, there will be a huge level of competition for those dollars, obviously. We have more than a billion dollars worth or multi-billion dollars worth of need in our water systems across the country, across the state rather, and, and so we think this will be a very competitive project process and we will be making recommendations based upon uh, the most abject need that exists and is established by the submissions of the various water districts. And then finally, as you recall, we've got a money provided for broadband. And that's an entirely separate part, uh, pot of money from the ARP dollars. Um, Ninety million dollars was authorized by the legislature to be spent this year. Uh, that uh, application process will begin on November 1st and it will close on December 1st. I'm sorry, December 31st. And we'll then make allocations to uh, various providers of broadband service who will uh, then build out broadband, be it fiber, be it towers, whatever it may be, to provide broadband access to rural areas of the state. One other area beyond that was the, the dollars that were allocated to local governments. Major cities across the country got direct allocations. We had 11, I believe 11 cities in Louisiana that got direct money. They got it sent directly to them, but every other community in Louisiana, their money is allocated. We know how much it is, but it's a pass-through from the state. So we've had to administer the distribution of those dollars. We have paid out all of those funds, except what I'll explain in just a minute, a total of $154 million to what are called non-entitlement uh, units. Those are smaller cities, communities, villages uh, who are entitled to get their particular share of dollars, $154 million. There is still, though, three, almost $320,000 that has not been distributed because we have nine villages in Louisiana that have not made application for the money to which they're entitled. And uh, this has been very puzzling to us because we've, the money is for them. It must go to them or it's got to go back to the federal government. And we have tried thus far vainly to get these villages to send in the information that they need to send so we can give them the money. Uh, we've advised the speaker and the president and legislators of uh, these villages, so hopefully uh, I've given them till October 14th to get an application in. We extended the time that we were going to otherwise uh, complete this project because we want to try and give them the money that they're entitled to. So if you are related to anyone or know anyone who lives in these villages, uh, Gilliam, Jamestown, Keechee, Lily, Lisbon, Martin, Mound, Oak Ridge, or Shangaloo, please tell them that their money is waiting if they will simply make application. If they don't, that money will have to be returned. It can't be reallocated to any other cities or, or towns. It, has to, it goes back to the federal government. And then finally, uh, before I try and answer whatever questions you may have, I mentioned last time I was here, I think we had a month's worth of information on the new fiscal year, but uh, we now have two months. We have the, the months of uh, July, August, and September, and July was the reconciliation month where we're still closing out the books for fiscal year 21. But our August and September numbers are very encouraging. We're, we're uh, ahead of, of schedule based upon the forecast. Uh, the revenue is on track with the forecast. Um, personal and corporate income tax have come in stronger. Uh, sales taxes and vehicles have been right as, as projected. 
Um, so if this continues, obviously, we have a long way to go in 22, but we're optimistic about where we'll be in this, this fiscal year and hope that the end of this fiscal year we'll have uh, an excess just as we did last year in FY21. Um, FY21 has now been wrapped up. Um, the, we'll have to recognize the actual surplus that was left over from last year, but um, it, is, it is going to amount to what is close to a billion dollars. Now, that is not going to be the actual surplus because a constitutional provision has been triggered as a result of the increased amounts of corporate income tax we've gotten. And so because of the significant amount of corporate income, the provisions of the Revenue Stabilization Trust Fund has been triggered. We have the, the Budget Trust Fund, what we call the Rainy Day Fund, the Budget Stabilization Fund, but we also have a Revenue Stabilization, stabilization Trust Fund that was created in 2016. The people put it in the Constitution. And when corporate income reaches a certain level, anything above that must go into this fund. And so what we're finding is that in FY21, we are going to have a little bit over $300 million that will go into this fund, about $350 million. Um, so that will reduce what otherwise would be considered the surplus for the year. But we expect that the surplus for 21, the year ending on June 30th, uh, is going to be right around $650 million. Uh, of that amount, 25% must go to the rainy day fund, 10% must go to the unfunded accrued liability of the state. Um, so we're going to have a little bit over $400 million in surplus money from FY21, which is constitutionally limited on how the state can spend it. Um, the legislature, of course, must appropriate that money. They'll do so in a supplemental appropriations bill in the 22 session. We will recommend what we have recommended as long as we've been here, and it has not been always followed by the legislature, but we'll recommend that the, that money be divided evenly between coastal projects, deferred maintenance projects within the state, primarily on university campuses, and the Department of Transportation and Development to go to the backlog that we have on our roads and bridges in the state. All three one-time uses constitutionally allowed uh, and we think very smart use of one-time money. Um, the legislature will ultimately make that determination, and one of the challenges they will have this year, unlike a lot of years, is that we have so much of this federal money that is to be allocated as well and is dedicated to certain things. Um, but it's an unprecedented opportunity for the state to make long-term investments with one-time money, recognizing it is one-time money and can only be used for that purpose. Um, but. The good news is I think we will have a significant amount of money to, to spend, um, and I hope and believe that we will spend it wisely. We're certainly going to be recommending that it be spent wisely, and, and there are a lot of needs in the state that can be addressed with this money, and I'm looking forward to seeing what the end result will be when the legislature comes in next year. So with that, I'll stop and answer any questions about those matters or anything else you'd like to talk about. Yes, ma'am. The, the Revenue Estimating Conference met at the outset of the pandemic in order to recognize the reality that the economy had shut down and was not going to be nearly as optimistic as we thought. So the revenue forecast was reduced at the outset of the pandemic year. The good news is the economy performed better than that reduced forecast thought it would and continued to do well throughout the fiscal year. And so the forecast was exceeded by that much money. Uh, it primarily a result of a, an economy performing better than we thought uh, and a reduced forecast at the outset that, that was going to inevitably, we hoped, result in a surplus. You always want to have a surplus. You, you're either going to have a surplus or you're going to have a deficit, and you're not going to hit it right on the money. Though, try though you may, the Revenue Estimating Conference is not going to ever get it exactly on the money. Um, and so you'd like to structure a budget based upon uh, having money at the end of the year that can be used to make up for some things that arose during the year that you didn't have a budget for. And also on the ARP dollars, you know, there's still 50, about 50% 50 of it that still needs to be doled out. Is there any idea of where the, what those costs are going to be since we already have courts and such? And also with the severe damage that we had with Hurricane Ida, can any of this money go towards things that arose from that storm? It'll be a legislative determination on how that, that remaining half, a little bit less than half, of the three plus billion dollars is spent. And the legislature will make the determination just like they did by creating these pots. 
they can decide to keep these pots in place and simply add more money to them, give more money to ports, give more money in tourism. Um, or they may decide on some entirely new uses based upon a negative impact from, uh, from the pandemic. Um, I'm not sure what they'll wind up doing. Uh, there's, a, there's also great need from the storm, obviously. Uh, and this involves a very delicate dance with FEMA because uh, FEMA is responsible for a good bit of the damage, but um, there is also insured losses that have been incurred by the state as well as by individuals, but certainly by the state. We've had significant damage to state property. Um, and it's not going to be so much as to trigger probably our reinsurers. It's probably going to all be within the $50 million deductible that we have as a state in order to pay for damage. So that, that money, that insurance money will come out of the state in order to pay for the damage to our property. In terms of what may be relief may be available for individuals, it, it kind of depends on where things are with FEMA and whether the legislature wants to allocate any particular money uh, for that purpose. Um, there is going to be an interim emergency board scheduled, and I think it may have already been scheduled, to, to try and allocate the remaining money from the IEB, which is not a huge amount. It's a little bit less than $2 million that's left in the emergency fund. And I think the, the interim emergency board will take into consideration whether we can allocate some of that money to provide some immediate relief. Mark. Well, it, the Superdome can't wait to get back into business, obviously, and, and welcome as many conventions and gatherings like that as possible. And so it's going to be a very competitive marketplace nationally and internationally for conventions because literally 2019 shut down. Everybody who had a convention didn't have one. Uh, the political conventions, of course, happen every four years, but uh, the bread and butter of the Superdome and the bread and butter of the convention center in, in New Orleans are major conventions that come to town, and they're, they're working feverishly to... I know the convention center is and the, and the New Orleans tourism entity working hard to try and bring people to New Orleans for that purpose. Um, so I think every, every possible opportunity is going to be advanced and I, we hope and we think the, the virus is ebbing and the pandemic hopefully um, is, is slowing so that we're going to be able to get things back in Louisiana the, the way we want to. And I absolutely believe there'll be a strong resurgence of tourism everywhere and I think Louisiana is particularly poised. Uh, because we're such a great destination. Once international travel starts again, there's a tremendous opportunity for Louisiana and New Orleans to be, um, be the, the target for so many people because international visitors love the international flavor of, of Louisiana. Mark. The price of oil has been going up pretty substantially. I mean, it's almost double what, what the estimate is going to be. What's the impact going to be on our budget? And when will we see it'll, it'll be an impact. Whenever the REC meets again, and we need to meet in the, in the not too distant future. I'm not the chair of the conference anymore, but we'll need to meet in order to get an updated forecast so that we can go forward with prepara preparation of the executive budget. Oil this morning was $79 is, is what I saw. And so it's, um, it's really made a huge recovery and it will have a positive impact on the budget because we had a very a pretty, pretty conservative uh, oil estimate. But it's not a significant percentage of the budget relative to corporate and personal income sales tax, vehicle tax. It is a, is a factor in the budget. It will help us. It will improve the forecast, um, but it won't have the dramatic impact that we've seen from personal income and corporate income. How long does it have to be high before we start counting on it's a, it's a question for the economists, and, and they'll, they'll tell us that they, they like to see uh, multi-month of steady increases or stability in the oil price before they'll raise the forecast. I don't think you'll see us raising the estimate very, very high uh, based upon current prices. I, I, would, I would think we'll continue to be conservative because it's such a volatile market um, that <clears throat> I, I, I doubt you'll see it to rise to a level that oil prices are at right now. I don't think it'll come even close. We'll continue to be conservative. The REC is typically conservative as it should be. And, and I think we will be as we look at the price of oil. And I'll ask you another I, so you, Going back to the Superdome and the Bond Commission, uh, I believe that Senator Alon was wanting to do some sort of uh, investigation of uh, future income type of, uh, is that what you were talking about? Is that what he's looking at? 
No, the, the item that's on the agenda for the meeting in October is to look at priority five projects. Uh, first time this has ever been done to, to kind of reconsider, if you will, the approvals that have already been given for priority five projects. My hope and my expectation is the bond commission is not gonna mess with what has already been approved in priority five. We'll have a discussion about it. The Superdome is one of those entities that has money in priority five. It has 25 million in priority five. So that's what I think will open the door for some discussion at the October meeting. Um, but the debt commute that I'm talking about is not an item on the agenda for October. I hope it'll be an item on the agenda for November in order to vote on this once and for all. It'll be something we'll be talking about, um, but it's, it's just part of a, the big package of funding for the Superdome improvements. It just, it just so happens that the Priority 5 discussion includes a Superdome allocation, and apparently the legislators want to have another discussion about Priority 5, which, as you know, is simply the trailing money for projects that are already funded and already in place. It's, it's, a, it's telling you in the interest of transparency, this is how much a project ultimately will cost. We don't need all the money right now, so we put it in priority five. We'll need it in future years. Um, it'll be very unfortunate, I think, if there's an attempt to take away some money that is in priority five. I don't think that'll happen after there's a discussion, but that's, that's what the item on the agenda will be to discuss it. Yes, sir. It's a very big pot. But tourism promotion tends to vaporize quickly. Uh, shouldn't we be paying attention to some of the fundamental causes of tourism, such as recreational fishing and hunting, people who were wiped out by Ida, and the former cottage industry, but nevertheless, an industry? Yeah, you're right. I mean, there's, there's some devastating impacts on the coast in particular where hunting and fishing, uh, fishing in particular, a big part of, of what we market that you can do in Louisiana, but there are a lot of other things you can do uh, elsewhere in the state. Um, you know, obviously my time as Lieutenant Governor makes me a big promoter of the tourism industry and recognizing its impact and the multiplier that it has. So because of this competitive environment that I'm talking about, I think every nickel we spend to promote Louisiana and to promote individual areas of Louisiana is money well spent because it brings in dollars from outside of the state that our taxpayers are not paying. Now along those lines, certainly in terms of recreation, one of the uh, grants that's been established in the wake of the pandemic are recreational grants. And we have applied just this week for a very significant recreational grant that will I think be a game changer for several recreational projects that, that would benefit if we're able to get that grant. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping that happens and we'll have an announcement at the time if we wind up getting that. Uh, but certainly what, you, what you're saying is accurate. We've got to be very cognizant of, of uh, making certain that the things we sometimes take for granted, like the, the wealth of Louisiana's uh, hunting and fishing, uh, needs to be preserved. Yes, sir. There seems to be an awful lot of misinformation, maybe uh, purposely expended to uh, conflict utopia with excellence in our national politics, such as just this week uh, that the election wasn't uh, correct or that uh, the vaccine hadn't been given to enough people or it'll change your DNA. And this continues to be ongoing. Could you comment on the election Well, I, I have tremendous confidence in the um, integrity of the election process in Louisiana. Uh, having served in that role and, and knowing what's involved and, and knowing um, how the elections are handled with the safeguards that are in place, I have a lot of confidence in our, in our elections, and I think that's been borne out. We haven't had any challenges, any irregularities uh, in recent years that, that uh, come close to some of the things that have happened in other states. And um, beyond that, I'm, I mean, I, I think we had a fair and open election. I think that's been established nationally, um, and we certainly had it here in Louisiana. Can you comment on the second portion about the misinformation, such as the tourism? 
or vaccines aren't tested, or that just as we, well, the point of course again was that the election was uh, not accurate. Well, I think there's a lot of misinformation about many topics uh, out there and nowadays, and, and this is the press club and you're journalists, and nowadays virtually everybody can be a journalist by virtue of the internet, and, uh, and, and there's not really any checks and balances on what's said one way or the other. So I think you get a lot of distortions and a lot of misinformation, be it on the left or be it on the right, uh, but, but that's the way people get information nowadays, and unfortunately that leads to some misinformation. Right. It's not going to start anytime soon. Um, the original original point we made on, on testing, and I remember the comment I made here, was we had to first determine whether it was legal in order to require testing if someone was unvaccinated. And we crossed that hurdle. We decided it was it was legal and it was something that the state could require of its employees if it if it chose to do so. Then we had to get into the nitty gritty and the weeds of how would we implement such a testing program. And what we found was that there was a great shortage of tests, number one. Um, and so we didn't feel confident that there were enough tests that would be available to test state employees who may not be vaccinated. And there was not a degree of certainty as to when enough tests may be made available. And then we also started thinking in terms of the logistics of how this would be handled, where the tests would be given, how often they would be given, who would administer them, um, what determinations would be made if there was a, a false positive, a number of just practical questions when we sat down and started talking about how we're going to do this. And the combination of those two things, as well as the fact that we're moving in the right direction right now and, and things are improving, um, the governor made a decision and we made the recommendation that we not proceed with any plan to test. And so we're, we do not have any immediate plans, <clears throat> excuse me, any immediate plans to do so. Well, they, they, any, any state employee has the same right as anybody in, in the public to, to choose not to be vaccinated. There's no, there's no coercion that's involved on the part of the state. So um, state employees who choose not to be vaccinated are just like anybody else who chooses not to be vaccinated. Obviously, the governor and, and I personally would encourage anybody and everybody to get vaccinated. I mean, it, it just it boils down to common sense that this is, is something that is uh, designed to prevent the spread of the virus. and. Um, I'm certainly satisfied that it's an appropriate vaccine, and most every expert you talk to has said that. So we're hoping that more and more people will be vaccinated. We're encouraging that. We can't mandate that. There's no pressure being put on anybody except to basically encourage people to, to do what, uh, what is in their best interest as well as in the best interest of the people they work with and the people with whom they come in contact. Could you tell us more about this recreation? Um, I'm not going to do that right now because I want to. I want to wait and see what what happens on it. But it's uh, it's about an eight million dollar grant uh, that would provide some um, some needed funding for some uh, recreation related projects. It's tourism and recreation grant with a focus on recreation projects. And it's through EDAP. Yes, ma'am. It would simply add to it. Uh, we, we've been very aggressive in this area, and, and Vanith Iyengar and his, his two employees, or three people running the show on this effort, are, we're providing some uh, technical assistance, obviously, administrative assistance, but uh, they've done a tremendous job of, of advancing this program. Um, they today, in fact, I just signed before I came here some modifications to the emergency rules that we've submitted to get that put in place because we got further interpretation from the U.S. Treasury as to how the money could be used. So we had to tweak a couple of things. But um, I think there's going to be a tremendous amount of interest in those grants by providers who are going to be able to get speedy Internet access to parts of rural Louisiana that have nothing right now. And whatever additional dollars we get will just enable us to do more. And I, I do think there will be some more dollars for broadband. We know there's 90 million more already that will have to be allocated next year. And if one of those infrastructure bills passes, everybody seems to be talking about broadband being a significant component of it, so I think there's going to be more money in that area. Any time frame would you like to have the entire state 
I don't. I, I couldn't hazard a guess as to how long it may take, but it's going to be a very aggressive plan. I think the providers are going to want to move quickly because they make an investment with this money, and then they sign people up to 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 be to get service. I mean, it's going to it's going to have to involve Louisianians being willing to pay for service once it's available in the area. It's not free, but we got to get access first, and then there's got to be marketing efforts by the various providers to get people to to sign up. And as the society continues to evolve with uh, online transactions and, and what's going on, we're, we're going to become a society that eventually is going to become uh, totally dependent upon that, I think. Yes, sir. Uh, just casual reading in the advocate over the last two years, more than 20,000 Louisiana citizens leave the state every year. Um, I understand we're having some Afghanistan refugees that may come to the state of Louisiana. Before that's a, an issue, how is the state I don't know the answer to that question. How, what, what interaction is going to take place, or who may who may come, or who may not come? Yes, sir. Well, you better be the next coach of the LSU Tigers. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm not going to I'm not going to venture into what is Scott Woodward's business right now. We were just we were just talking about this walking in, and I'm I'm very excited. Both the men's and women's programs. I think it's going to be a great year. Uh, I think the SEC is loaded, though, um, and Coach Way's got a lot of talent, but so do a lot of other schools. It ought to be a great, fun, competitive year. I, I can't wait for the season. I didn't miss a home game last year, despite COVID. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to this season as well. All right, thank y'all very much.